Hello, this is Monica Reinagel, and you're listening to the Nutrition Diva podcast. Do you have a question or a topic that you'd like to suggest for a future episode or maybe a comment on a previous show? Well, you can call the Nutrition Diva listener line at 443-961-6206 and leave me a message. It's 443-961-6206. I'd love to hear from you. This week, I'm talking with registered dietitian nutritionist and podcaster, Melissa Joy Dobbins, about how you can do more with dinner, or what we're really going to talk about is how you can get more from dinner. Joining me today on the podcast is Melissa Joy Dobbins, a registered dietitian nutritionist who served for many years as a spokesperson for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and she's also the creator and the host of a terrific podcast called Sound Bites. Welcome to the podcast, Melissa. Thanks so much, Monica. So one of the things that you and I have in common is a real allergy to misleading or just plain inaccurate information about food and nutrition that seems to circulate so freely these days. And in your Sound Bites podcast, you frequently bring on experts to dispel misunderstandings and myths and really give listeners a more nuanced understanding of the science. And you've even created a series of resources that help other nutrition professionals communicate more clearly and effectively in the media. But today, I want to talk more about your Do More With Dinner project. And as you've said, this is not about doing more because most of us already feel like we couldn't do one more thing. It's really about getting more from this daily necessity. And in fact, more stands for make ordinary rituals extraordinary. So tell us, what was the inspiration behind this project? Thank you, Monica. Yes, this really started out as sort of a personal quest. Uh, A few years ago, I, like a lot of people, just found myself at that New Year's resolution time thinking, well, what do I want out of this new year? How can I live a better life, be happier, be healthier, um, spend more time with my loved ones, have more quality? And I was traveling a lot. I was working a lot. I was kind of stressed out. And I thought, you know, the one time of my day that is really sort of getting the short end of the stick is dinner time with my family. And as a dietitian, I know all the tips and tricks for getting a healthy meal on the dinner table. Um, And as I talk about in my podcast a lot, I'm not the most culinary person, but I, I can cook a pretty good meal. I can follow a recipe and I know what I like and I know what my family likes. But I was just, you know, stuck with that, you know, five o'clock, what's for dinner, kind of just pulling together. Oh, I've got some chicken breasts. I have some baby carrots. I've got all this. Let me just put it all together and have a balanced plate. And it was kind of boring and kind of not the most fun part of our day. Um, And I thought, how can I do more? And of course, when I thought about that phrase, I'm like, well, I don't want to do more. Just like you said, we're all doing so much. I don't want to do more. I want to get more. I kind of want to do less. I want more ROI. So um, I thought, okay, what would that look like for me? And I just started brainstorming with my teenage daughter, who's off in college now. And now my son is 10 and my husband working, traveling. Like, what does this look like? Um, you know, do I want to spend more time in the kitchen? Do I want to spend less time in the kitchen? Do I want to try new recipes? Do I want to, you know, do more meal planning? And what I came to was, you know, if this is something that I'm kind of struggling with and there's so many different options and things that I could do, that I wanted to share it out with other people because what I started pulling together the resources I had at my fingertips from our fabulous dietitian colleagues, I thought, well, gee, these will be great resources to share out with other people. So basically what it came down to mean for me was simply sitting down once a week and looking at our family schedule and deciding what nights I might possibly be able to cook. Do I have a little bit of time? Do I want to just throw together one of our tried and true favorites? Do I have a little bit more time? Am I interested in trying something new? What nights um, are people going out to basketball practice or play rehearsal? Or am I out at a meeting? Or is my husband traveling? Am I traveling? Whatever. And so really that kind of became the anchor. And it just kind of went from there where I sit down once a week, I figure out what the week sort of looks like. And like I said, it could be making a family favorite healthier. It could be trying something new. But really the 
biggest um, and best part of the whole experience has been our family conversations. So I can tell you more about that. Right. So let me just tell people what this toolkit that you've created, and of course, we'll have a link to the toolkit in the show notes for today. So you've gathered together a lot of great resources created by dietitian nutritionists and some others, things like recipe collections and meal prep and planning tools, kitchen organization tips, um, some information on children's nutrition for people who have children of different ages or different concerns. I, I love that you even included a guide to starting your own garden and maybe growing a little bit of your own food. And these are all there for people to tap into as they think that they might be useful. But as you just kind of uh, alluded to, you know, dedicating some time to meal planning and preparation can definitely upgrade your family's nutrition and save money and decrease food waste and all that good stuff. But this isn't really just about nutrition, is it? It's also an opportunity to become closer as a family by using that time to, as you say, have some good conversations. There's one resource in your kit that I love that is just a whole collection. This is the family dinner project. Mm -hmm. Have I got that right? Yeah. The family dinner project. And it's just a huge treasure trove of conversational gambits um, for families of different ages. Interesting things that you might bring up. Some are silly, some are serious, uh, and some guides on, on how you can use that time to, to really um, connect with your kids, have important conversations. And I would say even for families without kids to connect with your partner and, and use that time to, um, to explore some interesting territory. Absolutely. When I started thinking about this, my daughter came home from school and she said, well, mom, we learned about this rosebud thorn thing. And I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, I think the Obamas do it, but uh, it's basically, it's very simple and it's a great way to enhance your family conversation. So what it is, everybody goes around and says what their rose is. And that's the best thing that happened to them today. Then everybody goes around and says what their thorn is or the worst thing that happened to them today. And the last one is the bud. And that's what they're looking forward to. And that's where we really got into some interesting territory because, you know, it's pretty typical to say, how was your day? What was good? What was bad? But to think about peeling that layer back and going a little deeper, hmm, what are you looking forward to? Of course, my son who's 10, you know, it could be nine months away from his birthday and he's planning the birthday party, <laughs> you know, but when you've got, you know, tweens or teenagers and uh, you start getting into maybe some really important and enlightening and oftentimes funny conversations. So we use that a lot. And yes, the family dinner project, I stumbled across that right after I started working on this whole concept and just love their resources. In fact, I interviewed Lynn Berenson on my podcast about the whole family dinner project. There's a book, there's a wonderful website that has all kinds of anything from actual meal type suggestions and recipes to these conversation starters. Well, I love that little twist of the bud of the rose because I think uh, many of us have heard about a tradition in families where you say the best thing, the worst thing, but that adding that that third element of something that you're looking forward to kind of opens up imagination and aspiration. It reminds me actually of a little practice that I use in one of my coaching programs where we just take a minute at the end of every day uh, in terms of our um, goals with behavior change and evaluate what went well, what maybe didn't go so well, but what are my opportunities to change the story tomorrow? And it, it really is a nice way to kind of pull together the day, but also you know, think a little bit intentionally about the future. And that can be used in all kinds of ways, as you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Melissa, now ideally we know families will sit down together most evenings and eat a family meal, but I know families today really struggle to make this happen. And I think there's a lot of guilt about it, which as we know is usually not terribly productive. <laughs> we just feel bad about how we're not measuring up. Are there ways to make this project, this initiative more accessible? I, I often talk about the benefits of having a good enough diet. What's the good enough version of the family dinner? Are we, are we setting the bar too high and therefore just you know, not willing to try? Monica, you're absolutely right. In fact, I just returned from an international conference where I learned a lot about how meal times and dinner time is evolving or de-evolving. And I'll be sharing some of those insights on an upcoming podcast. 
But, you know, we are snacking more. Our meals really look different than they used to. And ironically, this image that we have of the family dinner time may not even be based in reality, not just for today, but in the past. We may have imagined a lot of this. So (laughs) you're absolutely correct. There comes a lot of guilt can come along with this. And as the guilt-free RD, because food shouldn't make you feel bad, I really identify with that. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to share this out with other people, because I think for myself, there's always a fine line between how much effort you're putting in and how much you're getting out of something. And it's a delicate balance that that we walk every day. And I really want people to get more out of their efforts. And you know, we talk about that a lot in the field of nutrition as well, um, just as far as our healthy eating or weight control or disease management. You know, we only have so much time, a very limited amount of time to put towards these different areas of our life. So so that's why I really want people to know if you have this dinnertime opportunity, how can you make more of it? And what does that look like for you? For somebody who's kind of interested in culinary um, aspects of food, it might mean dabbling into some more recipes and trying something new. Um, for a busy mom, it might be, how do I get in and out of that grocery store in as little time as possible without those impulse buys and I have everything I need so I don't have to go every other day. I just go once a week and I'm good. It could be about decreasing food waste if you're interested in the environment. Um, but it also doesn't have to be dinner. If breakfast is an opportunity for you to share with your family, um, and I know as my kids have gotten older, it's kind of a moving target. You know, uh, when I started this project, we did have several nights a week where we were all together, but that quickly changed to maybe once or twice a week when we were all at home at the same time for dinner. So it could be breakfast, it could be lunch. As you mentioned, maybe you don't have kids at home or you don't have children, but you have another sort of family, your friends or your community. So it could be a supper club sort of a thing. So you can really make it whatever you want. And that's what I want for people is to think about, you know, what are their goals and what can enhance their whole eating experience from not just a nutrition standpoint, but from an emotional and social standpoint. Yeah, I think sometimes with all this emphasis on meal planning, there's all these apps out uh, and people get the impression that they have to have a 28-day meal plan with 28 different dinners, <laughs> you know, 28 new recipes that are going to be created for the very first time. And, you know, in, in my house, we do do some meal planning just to kind of keep ourselves sane. But honestly, we have about 10 recipes that we rotate through with minor variations. You know, we are not cooking gourmet meals every night. So meal planning doesn't happen have to mean that you're running a restaurant. It can just mean, you know, that you are not waiting until five o'clock to think about, oh gosh, what what am I putting on the table tonight or what am I feeding myself tonight? Absolutely. And you're a professionally trained chef and you're saying this. So <laughs> for the rest <laughs> of us, um, no, and it's, it's very interesting. I also um, did a recent podcast on meal planning with two of the uh, dietitian resources in my toolkit, Toby Amador and Jessica Levinson, because I too was sort of like, I'm seeing all this stuff about meal planning and meal prep. And other than sitting down and looking at my schedule for the week, I'm not sure what all that means. So we, we dived into that a little bit. But what I learned pretty early on in this whole project, in this um, experiment, if you will, was I really only have time and only need to cook maybe two nights a week. When you look at leftovers or we can call them planned overs or, um, you know, kind of, oh, it's Friday night pizza night and we um, take all of our, you know, leftovers for the week and make a nice, you know, pizza and and use up the, you know, decrease that food waste. Um, it, It really surprised me. And it's been that way for years where I know I only really cook about two nights a week, which blew my mind because yeah, I thought, okay, I'm going to be cooking like five, six nights a week. And that's not the case at all. Sure. And and there's also no crime in taking advantage of some of the meal prep steps, you know, for, for people where time is really at a premium, it's not cheating to take advantage of some of the steps done for you when you can buy vegetables that are prepped and ready to go or little components of the meal that have been prepared. Um, there are some smart shortcuts that we can take and we needn't feel like we are falling down on the job by taking advantage of those. 
Absolutely. And there's meal delivery services. We, mm-hmm. we tried some of those. Yeah, there's so many options. We really do have a lot of tools and resources available to us. And like you, yeah, there's certain recipes that, like I said, they're tried and true and they're going to be repeat, uh, you know, uh, dinners uh, or, you know, maybe they're brunches or lunches. But, you know, it, yeah, we it, just like with nutrition, I used to tell my patients, and I don't know if this is true, if there's any like citation for this, but we tend to eat around 20 same foods all the time. Like, you know, if we have bread at home, well, that's the same bread we're going to eat the rest of the week. And so it, it is, you know, we, we can throw in some variety and change things up. But once we kind of have a pattern and we see that pattern, um, we can use that to our advantage. And, you know, some people want more variety than others. One of the interesting things I learned about the meal prep is some people actually do this Sunday meal prep and they put everything into individual containers and they actually do eat the same thing every day. And I thought, well, that's not for me. Right. Maybe and somewhere in between those two extremes. <laughs> yeah. But you know, there are a lot of, maybe it's the millennials, maybe it's um, young professionals who, you know, they just want to keep it simple and easy and accessible and healthy and they're not as much interested in variety. But yeah, I'm like, that's not for me. But maybe batch cooking would be more helpful than instead of the traditional meal prep that we're seeing on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important to find that solution that fits your lifestyle and your preferences and, and your family's uh, rhythms. Mm-hmm. You know, speaking about families, you know, we, we tend to hear a lot about the specific benefits that kids and specific reap from this practice of having family dinners together. There are studies showing that they, on average, do better in school. They have lower rates of eating disorders and obesity, also lower risk of depression and substance abuse. I haven't seen as much research on the uh, the benefits that adults gain from this practice. Um, have you just even anecdotally or from your own experience observed that you know what what the parents or the adults or the childless households might have to gain from this? This isn't just about helping kids do better in school, right? Right. Well, and, and I have seen some of that research that shows not only does it help kids do better at school, but it helps adults function at work. And mm-hmm. we've seen that even with like the breakfast research, you know, kids get better grades and, and that has been extrapolated to adults performing better, you know, at, at work. But yes, for me, I knew when I started this, the real reason I was doing it was more from a heart and gut and emotional place because I kind of knew I had the nutrition stuff sort of covered. But uh, I've been really surprised and um, blessed that the experience has really brought me even more than I than I thought it would. Um, e- even just the nuance of yes, you know, we we don't have screen time during dinner, but just m- making yourself stop and be present. That's really been my goal the past few years. Is we've got so much going on. Everybody's lives are so busy. We're running in all these different directions. We're so distracted with, um, you know, whether it's social media or email or electronic devices and just to sit and be present and have those conversations. And, and I've just, I've really enjoyed the evolution. You know, uh, like I said, when I started, my son was probably six or seven years old and he's almost 11 now. And he's become quite the little conversationalist and storyteller. Uh, and it's just, it's just really a fun part of our day that, that I look forward to. So I know that it's enhanced my quality of life. <laughs> and there are some dinner party guests in the future who will have you to thank yes. for, you, for your son's conversational <laughs> skills. Melissa, I want to thank you so much for, for joining me on the Nutrition Diva podcast today. We have a link to the Do More With Dinner Toolkit in our show notes, which are at nutritiondiva.quickanddirtytips.com. And if you're not already listening to it, please check out Melissa's podcast, Sound Bites, which you'll find on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher and all the usual places. And in fact, in this week's episode of Sound Bites, I'm going to be joining Melissa to talk a little bit more about the value of a good enough diet, as well as how you can chart a sane course through the wilderness of nutrition news and nonsense that we seem to be exposed to every day. But thank you again for joining me, Melissa. My pleasure, Monica. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Absolutely.
Hey, if you want to eat healthier, but you feel like you don't know where to start, why not join us for the next 30-day nutrition upgrade, which starts in just a few days. I'll show you a simple approach that I've developed that can help you improve your eating habits without going to extremes. All the details are at nutritionovereasy.com slash upgrade. Thanks so much for listening and have a great week. 